All right, man. How you doing? How's it going? Snap. I'm good, mate. How's it going? Good to all see right, you. Man, yeah. You too, man. Uh, all good, man. All good. Keeping busy in that, then? Keeping busy. Just, uh, so just opened a wee, uh, a wee boomers, man. Just having a nice, right. uh, chilling out, having a wee cider on a nice Sunday night, eh? You in Spain just now, yeah? Spain, I just uh, Costa del Wishy. Cool, nice. Wishy, aye. Oh, yeah. Wishy, uh, wishy up in Wishy, aye. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, been here all my days, aye. So, uh, Wishy boy, born and bred, aye. That's it. Were you in East Coast Bright or is it Cumbernauld? Cumbernauld, um. Cumbernauld. Yeah. It's not, it's not Beautiful. Really exciting. Beautiful. Nice <laughs> and concrete up that way. Yeah. Um. Aye. So just uh, just taking uh, taking the nice weather and that, and uh, just doing a bit of songwriting, just doing a bit of getting getting back to grips with it. Aye. Nice. So um. I was say, no, I was saying about was saying about before that talking about the the Vigo thieves. That was. Oh yeah, yeah. When was that, man? That was. Did we not play a gig in Walkabout? Was it Walkabout? No. Where was it? Or together, like uh, I'm sure we we um should we play that gig together? We might Must have actually, it? yeah. I think we did. Like when it first, like the first uh, yeah. opened or something. Oh, um, we definitely did. We definitely did. Yeah. Maybe it was the walk like about the rock radio thing. There was like a rock. I radio. think that was. Aye, that's yeah, what it was. Man. It was rock radio. Aye, I'm sure that's what it was. Uh, that was ages ago. Uh, we actually did. We actually did. We were on the pitch at Ibrox with, with Rangers because we did a single thing, we daft. And then during the game, and then after it, we went straight to play that rock radio. I'm sure we did. I mean, it was the day after we played the rock radio. Yeah, I can't remember. That was many, many moons ago when you were playing every, every, every venue in Glasgow. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Totally. Um, aye, it was good. But uh, I had the Vigo days there, uh, that was a good few years ago now. I, th- I don't know whether this was before or after that then. Um, I got like a filming job and I shot. I, sh- I was part of like, a team that shot a video for you guys in G2. So it was like the Garage 2. Aye, was, that like, was it. Like, fundraiser for Rangers. That was right. We played the G2. Uh, oh, that was that was when we just didn't have a clue what to do and what how to do it and what was going on. Um, that must have been about 10 years ago, maybe. Something like that. That was a long time ago. Yeah. Oh, those, those, those were the days, starting out in a band, Crazy just so, so young and just not understanding how it all worked. Uh, that was funny, funny. But um, how, did I that, the how did that bridge into... Like Saint Phoenix, because like I remember like Vigo Thieves being really big. So ha, what like what was this kind of stages between that band and, and where you are now? Um, it's weird, man. So what you know? It's all about advice. It's all about speaking to the right people. Everything that we've ever did is is about speaking to to people who have, have done something significant and giving us their time and listening to that advice and grabbing it with two hands so we were do, like, doing the Vigo fees we were doing it for about three four three years maybe four years and just getting just not getting anywhere um and then what happened was we got to um there was a guy the guy called tim vegan who used to manage uh, the streets and he used to manage the, Zo- the zootons and he used to manage a uh, he managed the view for a small bit, but it's basically the, the streets was his big band and the Zootons. And through a mutual friend, um, he was, he's a massive Man United fan. Uh, and Man United were playing Rangers in the Champions League, and I said, I said I'll get my ticket for for the Rangers game. And uh, he came up and maybe speak to him. So he came up and we took him for a dinner, and uh, it was me and Big Gino and Alan. Uh, we're just talking to him. And, Asking him, and he just said, "Like, he said, I've just been listening to your music. It's good. And what do you want to do?" And I just told him, "He said, well, what you need to do is stop what you're doing because it's not working. Because you were playing every gig that MD was offering you. He said, stop, take six months out, go and do an EP, 
and make one of the singles your best and do a video for it and then do a, do a, do a launch for it and sell it out and then do the same again and just, just gradually grow and grow and grow. So we did that and we wrote a song called Heartbeats and for a first EP, put it on the, put it on, uh, I think we did, we did Sleazies, sold out Sleazies uh, and did it ourselves, we did it with DF and all that, we did, sold it out and then we sold like 200 copies of the CD, sold out and then it was a brilliant. And then next minute uh, DF used the song for Tea in the Park, it's like the, is the the theme tune or whatever for announcing the the lineup and then for there uh, we got tea in the park and then we just we went to the art school and sold that out and then we started the old art school we sold that out then we went to the arches and then we went to, we just kept doing replicating it yeah. and then we got support we supported for tellies and the cartinas and we played tea in the park and just just kept building up and then we did we sold out the the abc twice but um, the problem we had back then was we kept holding back an album and we just concentrated in Glasgow, which was a stupid idea. We just, we, like, it was us, the Lafontaines and Fatherson, and we were all big in Glasgow, but the Lafontaines were playing outside Glasgow and so were Fatherson, but we just concentrated in Glasgow, which is stupid. Anyway, cut, um, just to, to bridge on St. Phoenix, what happened was the reason I was talking about um, speaking to the right people. So after we did that, um, there's a guy for, for Glasgow called Raymond Mead. He's plays an ocean colour scene now. So this is before we played this is before we played the Archies and Raymond Mead said to us I said to him, he said, Why go for a coffee? And went to the Archies and had a coffee. He was just talking about because he's he he supported the King to Leon and he was like sort of generation before us in terms of bands coming through, he played uh, the in the Renelles, and they were quite big. And he said, I think you should, he said, you got a manager? I says, no, we just did it ourselves. He said, I think you should message the, or email the manager of the killers, because you kind of you kind of like, you like the killers and you know, you could be like the Scottish killers. And I was like, ah, that sounds good. I said, but they're not going to buy taste. He said, just email them. So we are playing the Archies and after the rehearsal, Alan, my brother, who's in St. Phoenix, he's, he's at, he's, I said, I emailed that, the manager of the killers. He said, then he get back to us. I says, listen, what do you expect? They're not going to get back to you. So two days later, no, I did, that night, Alan emails, emails the manager of the Killers and says, listen, I've sent you a demo last week and uh, you just didn't get back to us and I find it really rude that you just didn't get back to us. So, <laughs> as you do. Yeah. So and, and like that night, we get a reply for the Killers management saying, well, we're really, really sorry we didn't get back to you. We get tons of demos every week. Um, but if you... If you uh, if you give us five minutes or give us a couple of days, we'll listen to your, your music and get back to you. So uh, do another rehearsal for that. She's gigging. Um, then uh, Alan's after the rehearsal, I was like, see that that killers management to get back to me. I said, like, all right. So they wanted they wanted they, uh, they like the, the tunes. They wanted a uh, Skype call. I said, oh, brilliant. He says, but it's not it's not the manager that kills us. Get back to it's another boy that, that works for them. So that the manager. It's called Reynolds Management, who managed the killers. So the, the manager killers called Robert Reynolds, but it was a guy called Mac Reynolds that replied to us. So Mac Reynolds, he's a manager of the Imagine Dragons. And uh, Dan Reynolds, he sings in the Imagine Dragons, but they're all brothers. So the brother manages the Imagine Dragons and the, the brother manages um, the killers. Anyway, we phoned this guy, man, and... Google and this Mac Reynolds guy message just been Imagine Dragons were becoming big. Yeah. Uh, so we Google him, it's asked what he looks like right now. I think Skype call him next minute. It's a boy in Las Vegas, Mac Reynolds. I was like, how's it going? He's like, ah, and just starts talking. Just oh, that's just crazy. So we start talking to him and he's like, I really like your stuff. I think you could do something. Um what are you guys looking for? Like, well, we're looking for management. He says, Well, our guy Jordan who does day-to-day -day manager of the killers he's looking for a project under their management level uh, brilliant so we started talking to them so then he just gave us advice in terms of how to write songs how to write better songs how to get on the radio how to be distinctive and different that's the biggest thing he always talks about being different distinctive he's and uh, uh, right okay so that was when my head turned and thinking if we want to go on radio and do stuff then we need to sort of change it up so by that time, I had 
come across uh, Ross Hamilton and Michael Bannister and rocket science yeah. just by chance and I went and I was it was basically through Ross's wife um because I was wanting a string piece put on a Vigo but Vigo, Vigo Thieves music and uh we were doing the string piece in Ross's studio and he's like listen do you want to write a song and I, I was just telling him basically telling him the story that I told you there and uh he's like let's start writing some songs and then because I was going to do the Vigo Thieves album still speaking to, to the man Imagine Dragons guys and then they were just like right okay Ross just completely changed the sound and I was writing with Ross and Michael. Michael was, he played with Texas, he still does, but he was out on the road and coming by, but it's mainly Ross. So we were just writing and recording. And then we wrote this song, one of our songs, the Phoenix song called King. And I was like, oh man, that's, this is different to what anything we've ever done before. Just the whole thing, it just feels right. So we're writing all these demos and, and uh, I spent about a year I spent all the money, I, all the money I, I had in that studio. I spent a year and I went about five tunes, six tunes, like really good tunes. And uh, I was at the rest of the, the view with these boys. So I was like, "Listen, here's where we're at. This is what I want to do." And they're like, "Nah, I don't think we can. The view with these can can do this. I don't think this doesn't really fit the sound." And I was like, "Do you know about Disney? What am I going to?" Do? So we we're like, "Right, what we've got to do?" And at this time, Matt, the Mark Reynolds at Imagine Dragons. Didn't know this, but his missus was, um, they were having kids, and I had a bit of, um, one of their kids was sick, so he was sort of taking that time off. And um, the other guy that was supposed to man was going to manage us, he left the, con like the company to, to go and manage somebody else, like a, a, a dance guy. So we were like, we were like, don't know what to do. And the Vigo Thieves were going to release this album, but these songs weren't really fitting. So I was like, I don't know, really don't know what to do. Um, and I, and I just read this big heartfelt email to Mark. I said, can you give us advice? And he went, he said, there's going to be a band out. Now, this is must, must be about five years ago. He, he said, there's going to be a band coming out. They're out there just now, but they're going to release this album and see next year they'll be the biggest band on the planet. And the reason why they're big, they'll be the biggest band on the planet is because they're distinctive and they're different. And that's what you should do. And this band he was talking about was 21 Pilots. This is before they were massive. So he said, watch for them coming out and they'll be huge. And because of the, just different and distinctive, that's what you've got to think about. So when they were coming out, I said, right, oh, maybe we should just try this ourselves and just see what happens. So the rest, of the, we told the rest of the with these boys, they were all cool. Like, they were like, listen, give a good shot. The, the, the new tunes are only for us and it makes sense you and I'll go and doing it. So I was like, right, no bother. And then... Me and Alan emailed every, we went on every major band's Facebooks in the world and found their manager's emails and just emailed them. Just said, this is St. Phoenix, this is St. Phoenix, a brand new project, looking for management. Here's the sound code link. Would you be interested? And we sent them to, must have been 100 major managers. And the majority of them got back to us. They were all getting back to us. Like, cool, man. Fallout Boys manager, uh, 21 Pilots manager, had Skype calls with him. All these guys were getting back to us. And we were like, this is just insane. This is just what's going on. And um, But they were all wanting information. And the, the interesting thing about the 21 Pilots manager said, uh, I've, I've, I've searched for you all over the internet. I want to know what you look like. I want to know if you're boys, your guys, your woman, your five piece two piece one piece i don't know what you are yeah. and because i can't look at you it's so refreshing i just got to focus on the music and the music wins so we sent like the, we sent them the one and we sent them king and those are the, the two tracks that we sent them and uh, it's just so refreshing because now i don't know what you're all about sometimes you'll hear a band and you go on youtube and see what you look like or um so we had the skype call with him and we spoke to a lot of people really um, and it was just to and, fro to and fro and and then um, we got in touch with um, we got two managers at the moment um, and they were they flew down to London just young guys uh, at the time and they were like oh, listen let's they're, they're more in the writing scene rather than the band scene so we want to do this project we can uh, we think we could be believe in it and they were just brand new they were just on it so when we spoke to them like, right okay let's go and then from there it was just like 
we're getting all these record deal offers, man. Just we got to the point where we we're trying so hard to get a record deal off the, uh, um, in the Beagle Thieves, like not getting sniffs, and then signed uh, signed with these managers, and we had we had like all the major labels come to Glasgow to see us in the studio. We can phone down to Warner Brothers box to go and see Muse and that, and we we're just like, this is just mental. So all these record deal offers, and my manager went, "We're not taking any of them." And I was like, "What?" He's like, "You're not taking one of them because it's too early, and you can get drop dead easy. So we need to just build it ourselves." Yeah. So we were like, "Man, um, this is insane!" And then uh, we didn't. We again, we didn't. We didn't take it. And then I. That was that was the start of the the journey. So that was I can that was put a long story, but that's how. It went from oh, Vega Thieves to 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 St Phoenix. So that was a bit a bit nuts, man. Um, but it's good fun. And then from from there until now, I think it's been three and a half years doing St Phoenix, something like that. Aye, it's been mental. It's funny it's how like the whole things like a like probably just like the same journey for you, man. But there's like significant things that have happened in that journey that are, like have clearly been the stepping stones do you know what i mean that have led to the next thing man like de- like what you're talking about about the decision to actually leave a band behind do you know what i mean that that is actually, in its own right was quite like you were saying you're quite well established in scotland do you know what i mean Glasgow, yeah like, it's quite a tough thing to leave behind when you've got something there uh, that's not I, that's crazy it's it's that well that's the thing and like i've got uh people People know like, kind of joke with, with the way that we go about because we used to do this thing with saying um, with you with these believe and it's like positive attitude and that we we believe in all that kind of stuff. We've been brought up with my, my old man about just being positive and just being uh, just having that mindset to just keep going. And I never thought of you with these would 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 maybe a band. I always thought we'd be the biggest band in the world. Yeah, and then when it doesn't happen, your soul gets crushed. I mean, in hindsight, you look back at it and go, "Well, there's a reason why you didn't make it because your songs wasn't good enough." Um, and that's that's fine. But at the time, you believe in it, and you got see getting. You've got to have that in your belly, no matter what. You could be the worst band in the world, but I know so many guys that are so talented and they're really good, but they've no fire in their belly, so they never make it. Yeah, but I know I know folk that. They're not the best tunes in the world, above, but they, they get places because they've got a serious fire in their belly, and that's what you really need. Um, but it's all about it's all about belief and and, and perseverance, man. And and that's what I could only advise to MD is just if you just keep on going and keep on doing what you're doing, and the growth there. I think that was the thing about Vigo that I realised it started to stagnate. It, it wasn't going up anymore. Yeah, um, and I know I had these songs. I believe in these songs so much. So I guess that's when uh, it was just like the right call. And the 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 good thing for us was the guys in the Vegas these were like, "No, man, you guys, it's still my best pal to this day. Like, speak to big, you know, the bass player every day, almost. Uh, Alan's obviously in the band with me. Chris, the keyboard player, um, he comes out with St Phoenix and tours and does all the the driving and taking and he mm-hmm. does all most of the backing vocals on uh, all the tunes still still use them because it, it, it goes well with my voice so yeah. chris is, still does the vocals for the, the back vocals and barry speak to barry uh, the, the guitarist so we're all still on good terms but it was it's a hard thing to do to make that call is splitting up and because you think at the time man there's two things you think, oh, I'm letting all these fans down, but there wasn't a lot of fans, but at the same time, but it's all the people who think you would never make it, you're proving them right, yeah. which is the thing, that is the thing that, I think it's the biggest thing that drives us on, it's like people thinking you're not good enough, or you're, you're I don't want to do that, and I was like, nah, I'll get a go, yeah. do you know what I mean, that, that's the thing that, that's why we wrote King, because Everybody, we went down for record label meetings with, with Ego Thieves and everybody was you know, interested. And I was like, right, okay, I'll write a song about it. And then that was what, what King was that they kicked it off. So, um, this metal, but even like with St. Phoenix, there's been, I've seen this the other day, there's been way more lows 
than there has been highs in St Phoenix, and St Phoenix looks like it, like it's went for that to that, and it's grown and everything's. We've had, we don't, we've had some unbelievable experiences, but we've had way more lows than we have had highs. But you just don't hear about them because because yeah. we don't we don't talk about it. Um, and it's funny. It's really, really. It's funny, and you know, it's like being in bands. It's the best, the best thing in the world, but it's the the worst thing in the world as well. And music is it's definitely mentally, it's one of the I would say hardest industry about because it's so tough, so tough. It's funny, like walking away from a band as well. Like on the last episode, uh, I had a guy called Alan Moffat on, and we were talking about like the the sort of like gang mentality that you get when you're in a band, and like walking away from that's actually quite difficult as well. Like the, the kind of bonds and relationships that you form because you've all been through the same shit. Yeah, yeah. So, weirdly, man, I'm, I'm I met Michael Bannister through Texas. Uh huh. Like, this fucking it was just I got referred as like a sort of like producer to work with uh, Johnny from Texas. Yeah, the Johnny Mark on it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, he um. So I was like, kind of, what's it called? Uh, shadowing Michael, he was like, "Can I show you how to do all the kind of production?" And was that in the? Uh, what studio was that? It was in Johnny's house. So was it? Just, yeah, so he's got a studio like Aye. just off his kitchen, man. And uh, Aye. it was and talking to him, man, like the kind of what you and I have done is like exactly what he was talking about. Like he was talking about condensing the the sort of control and power within a band down to like the the least amount of members possible. Do you know what I mean? Like so yeah. this work because it's basically like Johnny and Charlene. It's John, and Johnny and Charlene control everything. Yeah. Uh, it, I guess that 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 can yes that that is is different. I've seen bands that like I can total control freaks. Where Vigo Vigo was just like I wrote all the songs. Like I'm my job I'm a web designer, graphic designer, so that's what I did. I've did that since I left school. So all the designs, all the all the artwork, all the video, I mean, I did all that anyway. So they were like, he does it, he does it anyway, he's a creative dude. So I just let him go on with it. The guys were just like happy for me to do that. And I think that was a big thing that let us spur on, because like Barry was just, he didn't want to write songs, he wanted to play guitar, go, he's jumping a van with his mates and play gigs. So did Gino, so did Alan, and then Chris, he was pretty much he did songwriting but he the the band wasn't kind of his um music style for writing so he was fine to play and, and enjoy the ride so that was a good thing um and then obviously with this band it's only me and alan so it's yeah. fine it, it's fine but that, i would say that is too many cooks man spoil the spoil the the broth as they say uh, and it's it's tough i've been in a band before but it's i've been the drummer before and uh, I it doesn't get anywhere when there's five guys try to. You've, you've always got to have a, a leader in it that's saying, "Now this is where we're going," because um, it is it is tough. Um, and I guess that's that's why it's good with, with me and Alan. Although it's tough being your brother, man, because it's brutal sometimes. Because just it's it's a positive now because you can be total unfiltered and just call it as it is, yeah. both ways. And then you, and then two minutes later you're fine. But we have, like, that's why uh, when we go touring, when we did last year, we, we were away a lot, man. We did like four tours, um, and uh, all through the summer, basically from the summer May until November, we were away. And the guys we took with, they just weren't. They just we were we were really hardcore in your face all the time. Even like with the band and slagging people, and we've learned maybe not to push people's buttons. We're just used to that, yeah. and we and you learn other people aren't built that way, so you can't be as brutal, <laughs> uh, and you can't be as because then they'll tell you like I met I, like Rory who does a photograph or a photography, he's brilliant, but uh, he was saying this is just like a million miles an hour compared to other other tours we do. But that's just because me and Alan are brothers. That's basically it, man. Just having Hilarious. fun. Aye, aye. Um, lost, though, man. Like, it looks like he's having a good time, man. Um, I mean, it's... But that's, again, that's the thing about the per- perseverance and the persistence because 
so like I told you, we we had all these record deal offers and everything was like brilliant. And then managers at now we're not taking them, right? Okay. So then following that year, we're just releasing singles and Spotify was like getting millions millions of streams. This is brilliant. And then uh, woke up one morning to an email the Imagine Dragons manager saying, listen, the boys are playing the Roundhouse, they're releasing their new album Evolve, um, and the support act has basically landed in my lap, and I want to give you guys it. Do you want to support the Imagine Dragons? We're like, ah, you're right, man, I'll give that a go. So, that so was unreal. So, I support the Imagine Dragons, and we're playing Red and Leeds. Um, but the funny the funny story with that is, with that, we played all those gigs when we were a two-piece, and we were honking we were, we were, so we hadn't even played a, we had all these record deal offers and right? we hadn't even played a gig and we went down to meet our, uh, our, age, our agent who is our agent now. We hadn't even thought about what we're going to do live, what it's going to be like. Because I was just, I just, that's just saying I never really played keys or samples or played drums or played uh, guitar. I was always just singing and I had all this stuff happening. So we had to figure out what we're going to do live and it was just rubbish, man. It was just so bad. Because we were listening to so many people, the agents, the managers, um, what it should be. And it was just, we knew deep down what it should be, but we were just, we kept, you know, it should be this and that. So it took us a wee while and then we did, these gigs were great. And we just kept releasing singles. And then we're thinking, right, we were given, we, we were signed with, with Cobalt or AWOL. So they were giving us a wee bit of, like, not like, couple of grand here and they have to make videos and stuff and do it and do marketing mm-hmm. and we'd recoup that money back and then go again and recoup that money back but we really wanted to get a record deal because Alan was still working and we weren't making any money really from from anything doing music so um from there nobody was really interested after we'd, we'd turned down those initial offers um and we just kept putting out singles and putting out singles and it was good but nothing was really we never had any momentum. We never got to the next level. Um, so it got to the point where uh, the summer we didn't get any festivals. Like, what we got to do? And um, the booking agent said, listen, you just have to put an album. You've not put anything. So we can't, and you aren't selling at any gigs. You've sold at King Cuts and that, but you've not sold anywhere else. If you've played London, you've sold like five to six tickets. So nobody's going to come and see you so we can't really push for festivals in places if you're not selling tickets so all right what we want to do and um we were just a wee bit it was up and down up and down we were getting stuff and they were getting stuff and then it was just getting worse and worse and worse um because we're putting singles out and nothing was happening and then we got an american booking agent and it this guy called tom windish so he books like billy eilish and stuff he's like the biggest booking agent in the world so a brilliant, and uh, all of a sudden he got as a gig, a corporate gig like that, like a decent paying corporate gig, but like oh yeah, beauty, San Francisco, here we go. So me and Al were skint, and this was a good bit of money for this this gig because it was like Google and YouTube and it's like um, Silicon Valley over in San Fran, like it's all these tech companies they have these big big shows uh, they put on for that for their companies and they've got tons of money. So they were giving us quite a bit, a bit of cash to go and play this this one one show. Like, superb. We're checking out, right? We can fly to San Fran. We can play the gig. Because all, all the, the, the gear was hired. So just jump on, bring a guitar, bring a laptop, play the gig, jump back, and we could pocket um, a few grand each. Well, this is brilliant, right? So booking agent comes back and goes, ah, just to let you know, Donald Trump takes... Uh, 30% off the top line right away. Because that's what happens in America. If you make money, the, the IRS takes 30%, then you need to submit a tax return and get the money back. So I was like, oh, that's rubbish. That's our money snooker. And is it also, uh, I'm going to book out for the week and you're going to go to LA for a, for a whole week. And when you go for a week, we're going to book all these industry shows because it's like the cool thing you do. Yeah. Oh, all right, great. So that was all the money we we're getting scrambled on this 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 week. Like, oh, because... Uh, I was already the, the booking agent that we were absolutely skint. So, because my we always used to work with my dad. My dad was still on his business, so we didn't have jobs of that. And uh, so we fly to San Francisco, 
uh, Friday at LA, sorry. And uh, Youngblood at the time, he had just signed. He was in the same position as us. Really. He had he had played all these gigs in uh, in the UK, and all the labels just snubbed him. Said, "Nah, no for us." So he went and played as a, a thing in LA called School Night. It's an industry night that all the major labels go to. And he signed like this million dollar deal for his performance at School Night. So my manager's going, Youngblood has just got signed, right? Because of this show, we've got a slot on this uh, on this School Night show. So if he's playing and do a good job, then uh, that's we want to get an American record deal. Right, okay. So we get to LA. We're staying at, my manager lives out in LA because uh, he's filthy rich <laughs> and he's an absolute, he's an absolute asshole. <laughs> he's staying out in LA and uh, he's staying out in LA and um, we stayed with him and he's got two kids, man, right in this wee room, man, stuck in, in his Airbnb for the week. Uh, his kids are up at half six in the morning just screaming about we get jet lag. It's hilarious, and then he's at this big, big performance. What are you wearing tonight? And we always used to wear tracksuits for some reason. I think with the, the Scottish Beastie Boys, we wear tracksuits. I had this tin foil night track here on, right? And I was at uh, what we should do? We should wear skull masks when we jump on and we'll just rip it up, man. So you get these masks, man, right? It's like scarves, but with skull faces, I'll be putting on, ready to go. And this place is packed. Everybody's here to see us. So we so we, we get we roll up, sound check, everyone's all right, we go out and play, man. It's packed. And the stage is tiny. It's just not a gig venue at all. It's just this industry cool hip thing. Basically you're a you're a piece of meat and all these people it's not a gig, people just don't give a shit. They're just here to inspect you and just look at you. And it was rubbish, man. It was just there was a couch. I the stage ended there, and I was here, and this guy was just in front of me. It was a couch, and he was just wasn't even looking at me, and he's talking to his bird, and I'm screaming, I'm screaming, man, getting at big licks on mm-hmm. with, with with this skull mask on. I'm thinking, man, I'm I'm turning up to a living here, playing guitar, screaming. I'm I'm actually doing really good with my vocal, and you're not really interested, and it was just so you know what it's like. It's just so disheartening. Nobody's interested. But this was like one of the, big, the biggest show we've ever played to date because everybody was here to see us. And we just, just the whole thing was just, we weren't actually that bad. It just the whole thing was just rubbish. And, was um, room, like, was everyone in the room sitting down? No, they were, they were, start, they were clapping and cheering that, but we were just, the, the whole problem was, is we weren't what we needed to be live. We found that out a year later when we added John, the guitarist, and became a three piece. That's yeah. when we found out, right? We can, we can bar it, man. We can, we are, we'll be one of the best bands about now if we keep yeah. on doing what we're doing. We join the band, but at the time it was just me and Alan. It was just a disaster. So after the show, my, me, my manager, and Alan were just going for it, man. The car park, filling up, putting all our gear in the back of his jeep, showing each other, going, "This is it," and he's at, oh, because. He told me to wear the the jacket, the the, the the shiny jacket. Alan told me to wear the the mask on, and we're just going at it. It was just a disaster, <laughs> and then it was just so rubbish. It was so rubbish, and we were bummed. We were bummed. Yeah. And then the next day we had that thing called to play Winston House. So it's this thing down in Venice Beach where it's. It's all for creatives. This this guy says like it's just young creatives. I want everybody in this house in Venice, and I just want people to play acoustic stuff. So Ed Sheeran plays it, Justin Bieber plays it, all the upcoming bands play it. So managers add to me, do do yourself a favor, don't play, uh, don't play with the guitars and all the rest of it or, or the drums and that. Just play acoustic, and I will just play a, like a a cajon or something. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, just strip it down. So we stripped the tavern down. And it was this wee house, but it was packed, close in. But all these creators were there, record labels were there, Spotify, YouTube, all these folk. And we played. And it was brilliant. So intimate. But everybody was just loving it, loving the Scottish accent, their stories. Yeah. And Matt's like, that's what you need to try and do. You just need to try and get who you are across a bit more and trying to get 
be a wee bit more intimate. So we were we were like, this is this feels good. And then the day after that, we 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 travelled to San Francisco and played another industry night thing called the uh, pop scene. I think it was called, and it was a guy who used to be in the uh, Panic at the Disco. We were supporting his band. And that was brilliant. It was a it was a good night. It was a, a local radio DJ guy called Darren Axelson. He put it on. It was great. And then the day after, and then I so we played that, and we get three hundred dollars for the show. Yeah, for playing that thing with, and my manager left us. So we had we played that on the Friday. We had Saturday, Sunday to stay in San Francisco, and then we left on the Monday. But the Sunday was this this corporate show that why we were there initially for. So we, we played. We, we got there on the Thursday. So we had Friday, Saturday, in this one bedroom, uh, Airbnb, and we were staying in this house, one bedroom. It was three bedrooms. One bedroom was me and Alan. The other bedroom was another guest, and the other bedroom was the owner, Joe, his house. So we're in this wee Airbnb, and we're eating. We had 75. My manager took $200 because he had to pay for gas and something else to get us there to square that up. So me and Alan had $100 left, no money. Sitting in San Francisco, we kind of go to Alcatraz, kind of go in. We're just walking about everywhere, and we're sitting because we, and we, we got this big fee to play this show, but that's all away just to be there. And we're sitting, me and Alan, in this bed. We're watching Coachella uh, on the screen and we're eating this 70, we're eating this like $2 pizza. I'm just looking at it, I'm going, I don't know if I can do this anymore, man. It's just not going anywhere. It's yeah. just not, it's just not, you know, even we've been over here, we've done the school night, we've done all this and supported Amazing Dragons, we've played Red in the Leeds, but I just, it's not going up. And Alan just looked at me and says, you try to say, You've wrote a song called One Day I'll Be King. You got to chuck it. Said, You're an embarrassment. And just rolled over and went to sleep. And I was like, oh, fuck, fair play, fair play. But it's t- it's tough, man. And, and that's the first time in my life I was like, I felt like I feel like quitting. I feel like I can't be doing this anymore, man. It's just it's just too tough mentally. So then we come back to Scotland. We flew. We actually flew in cheaper flights. So we flew to Iceland. We had to wait in Iceland for six hours and then fly back for Iceland to Edinburgh. So we come back mate, and we're just dejected because no record deal offers come in, nothing. It's just, it's just it's what we got today. Literally had to go and find a job. I had to go and find a job. No money to make an album, get in the studio. It's like, oh, we big Ross or that. We're just what we got to do. And then, because my manager lives in LA, had a phone call at three o'clock in the morning, FaceTime. It was him. And he's just killing his cell off. And he's like, we got a record deal. We've got an offer in. As I was, I, we're all good. And we uh, woke up the next morning, phone news. Like, ah, we've got a got an offer in for from uh, AWOL. Basically, lets us be, lets us do everything independently. But they just back us the same way a major would. But we just basically call the shots and do everything creatively and uh, do what we want. And it was like it's basically a proper major deal. And I was like, All right, okay, and we signed it and. And then that was it, man. We started making the, the record two years ago, actually, uh, to this day. Two years ago, we started making the record and everything sort of changed from there. Um, had an amazing summer in Rocket Science with Ross. Um, but I'd already signed a publishing deal a couple of years before. So I was going to LA. I mean, I was lucky enough. I think uh, I'd my expenses paid so I was flying to America and writing songs um, so we had a lot of songs and we just took them straight into the studio and just uh, made the album um, and then that was it and then we released our first singles um, that was, we started recording the, the June July and then we released our first song, singles in November and then that was it, and then that led us on to the year we had last year. But again, like last year was like uh, last year was like stuff last year, man. Like, well, that's what I was, that's what I was going to say. You just don't know what's going to happen. You have no idea because yeah. we started last year like what we got to do. The albums, what we got to do. We we still don't have any fans, or we have a small minute. We can sell it touch in Glasgow. I've got some fans in London, Manchester, but not enough to do the tour. What are we actually properly going to do? 
So we, we had South by Southwest. We had we had that, which was good. So we went to South by, had the best time of our life, man. Yeah. Have you have you, have you been to South by before? I haven't, man. I, I kind of roughly know what it's like. Like one of my old bands done like Asia's equivalent of it in Singapore. Right. It's cool. Called Music Matters. We done something like quite similar where you play like the kind of like pubs around the the area, and then you'll play yeah. like a main stage. Like I don't know if if you do that or. I that that that's pretty much what you do, man. Um, but we went there, and it was us, the Snuts, Father Son, the Dunce. Um, it was brilliant. It was yeah. superb. I made the time of my life. Uh, and we come back and we're like, this is good, but what else are we doing? And then after that, um we got a small uh, a small um tour with uh, a band called Arizona. We did that but we're still thinking what are we gonna do? Um um we're still releasing singles, but we want to go and tour uh we want to go and do it on tour and go and, and do everything we, we, we want it to do, but just didn't seem right. We we're putting out singles and then we went to go and see Twenty One Pilots um at the Hydro and it's just what a, what a show. Absolutely amazing. And then next minute uh, we got an email in through the booking agent saying, Do you want to go and support Youngblood on his American tour? No uh like, aye. Well, it's yeah, no no brainer. And from that from that moment everything like everything completely changed. Um that was that was the start of just everything just sort of growing and getting bigger and uh, <clears throat> I just just everything was, was amazing. So that experience to get to do that was was unbelievable. Um Did you know his drummer like prior to that? No, story? well I know that Mikey I know that Mikey obviously played in Waiting for Go and Ross and Michael produced all the waiting for go stuff and i know that uh uh mikey used to do some stuff with texas or charlene in the support yeah. band with ross and then i didn't that's all i knew and adam the guitarist he's was capaldi's best mate for school yeah. and he's for Faltus, which is 10 minutes away from where we grew up um so that was good but we so we we, we fly over to uh, Atlanta. So the good thing is, the best thing with that tour was, he says, "Young boy, once you come on tour, um, also once you boys, there's four spare bunks in the tour bus, so you can come in the bus rather than drive a bit in a van like that." Right? Yeah. I do. <laughs> We're a bit skeptical because because you know, what young, you see, young boy, man, he's, he's nuts, man. Uh, I don't know what's going to be like on a tour bus, but. Um, we flew over. Atlanta was the first night. We just got there. Oh, probably we, we got in the plane and we were sitting beside the band uh, Idols. They were the nicest guys ever. Get to the hotel and Font Fontaine's DC. We were staying in the same hotel because they were touring each other and they were the nicest guys ever. This is just this just got off to the best start ever. And then get to the venue. It's about thirty four degrees outside. And this is a we get there about 12 o'clock during the day and there's a queue about 500 people outside this venue just kids it's one o'clock and it's mental oh, fucking, this is crazy and then we get there we go in the back door this big security guy uh with this wee lassie nick i thought it was a wee girl next a tiny tiny woman next to him with like a hat on glasses and this big wig trying to be secretive What's going on here? And it turns out it was Halsey, right? So like the biggest, the biggest female pop star in the world at the time. She was, she's going to be young, but so she was there. Like, this is just crazy. Yeah. And then Mikey, Mikey and Adam came out, and we just got to meet them for the first time. Usual Scottish pair having a laugh. And then, uh, so I'm show you. And we get into the venue. Well, that's just is brilliant. And then next minute, young bud comes out of nowhere and rugby tackles Alan. He's all right, he's all right, mate. All right, it's just gonna be crazy, mate. And then just walked away. Like, this guy's insane. <laughs> uh, but that so he's it, just a hundred hundred mile an hour. Uh, and right, the start, I don't know if he's going about that all the time. And uh, but he's the he's the nicest dude. He's the the best. 
Yeah. And his whole crew the best. But we turned up in Atlanta. We played, we thought we did all right. And then we watched him right after us for the first time and we were like, right, we are miles off it. We need to up our game because he is unbelievable live. He's a proper s- superstar when you see him. Um, and then that was it. So we did like, we did two weeks on in May. It was two weeks off. Then two weeks on in June, two weeks off. And then two weeks on uh, July. And then we were on his, I said, on his tour bus. So we were, uh, it was amazing. So basically you go play a show, go to merch after the show, jump back on the tour bus, take all the booze, everything, just take all the booze on the bus, all the food, sit and get a drink, have a good laugh, go to bed, wake up and you're in a brand new city. Yeah. Repeat, repeat that for two weeks at a time. It's just unbelievable, man. It was just the best time we've ever had uh, and it was just it just everything kept building like instagram twitter facebook likes streams everything and like this is this is proper and we've sat with the doms like, this is what happens so this is what happened to me i get big supports and then i started to grow and you just keep going you keep going and this is what happens i was playing 50 cap rooms 100 cap rooms and you just keep playing and playing and playing uh, and that was it. It just kept doing it, and then uh, these these we just kept playing shows and shows, and it just kept growing, and it was amazing. And, and we played LA, so we played LA, and uh, after the show, he said, "Listen, he had just had a song with uh, Machine Gun Kelly and Travis Barker out." Yeah. He said, "Machine Gun Kelly and Travis Barker come to the show tonight. So what, you come to the after party? He's upstairs." I said, "Listen, I want to talk to you." I said, what is it? So I'm doing this big European tour in November. And uh, I need to sort a couple of things out like with my, my agent and my manager and my labels and stuff because they're all pushing for supports. But I want you to do it because you, you are the best support ever. And I want you to do it. If you do it, Mark. Right, we'll do it, man. Yeah. Of course we'll do it. And uh, then after that, we uh, well, were just totally buzzing. Absolutely buzzing. And then we went to his... Uh, we went to his after party, Travis Barker, and uh, Machine Gun Kelly are kicking about like, what world are we in? This is yeah. And then it's on TMZ, the two of them outside the after party doing backflips into the crowd, and just just mental. Um, but we were speaking, half, halfway through that tour, I was I'm good pals with Care for the La Fontaines. Yeah. So I phoned Care, well, Care phoned me, and he's like, what's going on? What's, he said, tell me, what's going on? How is it? What's happening? I said, mate, it's absolutely brilliant. It's superb. Just everything about it is amazing. And he's like, do me a favour. I was like, you need to plan for the rest of the year. He says, don't make the mistake that we've did and be caught cold and you come back on a high and nothing happens. Yeah. I was like, right, okay, right, cool, cool, cool. So next minute, uh, so the second leg of that tour, young boy that asked us to do it. By the third leg we went on, for some reason, the dynamic had changed, and he wasn't talking about. But he was kind of being a wee bit shy about the old, the, the European tour, and so was his management and his tour manager. And I was like, "What's going on here?" So thumbs up. Oh. So we all had to, we had, we get really pal with the tour manager. I was like, "I said, what's going on?" I said, "I'm not going to lie. The manager's trying to hijack his, his other band. In. He's, he, he's, he's basically manager said, nah, you are not getting it. This other band's getting it.'" And I was like, you're joking. He's like, listen, we're all raging about it because we weren't used there. So we were just, in, I said, like, what is it happening? He said, no, I think this other band's going to get it and you guys are at the windy. Fuck. So we were just total dejected. Yeah. So I'm like, what we got to do? So my manager manages this other guy, a writer called Sam Roman. He's a, he's a writer. So he wrote Someone You Loved with Louis Capaldi. So we we've no, we've known Lewis for I've known Lewis for he used to put Vigo thieves at um at Bathgate and stuff. Uh, and I do before he get uber famous, I'd written a couple of songs with him. Um before he get big and my manager fought me because he's pal really pals with, with Lewis, his manager, and he's uh, uh phone Lewis and he said, I think you can get the American tour. So you phone him. I'm not phoning them, that's embarrassing. I hate when people ask me 
for support, I hate asking people being that guy asking for supports because I hate when people ask me. It's just, I, you need to do it because it's the only way you get doing it, but it's really awkward. And I don't want to do it. I'm not that kind of guy. He's like, if you want it, you'll do it. I was like, all right. So I text him, I was like, Lewis, just what you know, if you're looking for somebody to do your American tour, we'd love to support you if you give us the opportunity. Anyway, dingied, nothing back, no reply. I was like, oh, I said, I see. I feel like an idiot now. And uh, he said, I think, he said, my, my manager, I think he could get it. So we're thinking, well, if we're not getting the Youngblood tour, if we get the Capaldi tour, although it doesn't really fit musically, we just want to go and play. Yeah. But we thought right, there might be a chance of getting that, then nothing's happening. See, we're like, man, it just gutted again, thinking what we got to do, because we're still only big enough to go and tour ourselves. We don't know what we're going to do. Uh, so we'd put another single and we come back for the Youngblood tour. We were greeting because it was so good. And then we'll like, put a single, what we've got to do. And um, my missy said to me, she says, eh, there's two things I want this year. I've not had a holiday in three years. I want to go holiday. And number two is we've got a family wedding in Isla. Right? You can't even miss it. That's the only two things. Do what you want. I want you to do whatever you want for the last so many years. The only things I want this year, two week holiday. And the family holiday in Isla. What happens obviously in the summer? I'm touring, so the, the holiday gets kicked out the window. I had to actually leave that early, so she was all right with that. But so we're doing it. Uh, we're doing it. My my mother in law's, and um, we're talking about this family wedding. They're all excited and doing this and doing that. We're going to Isla, and we'll stay in this. Next minute, my manager phones me. He's like, "I've got the Capaldi tour," and I was like, "Oh, what?" And this was like, "But it's next week," so it was like literally in a week's time. Because can we do it? So I'm sitting to my missus and my mother and going, I think we've got the Lewis Capaldi tour. It was four weeks and I'm missing the, I'm missing the maiden. <laughs> and I was like, shit, everybody about listen, it's Lewis Capaldi, you have to, you have to do it. So uh, I, we got that, next minute we're on his tour, we announce it, and then literally two days later, young bud phones up, he's doing the European tour. We're like, yes. So like basically, Lewis Capaldi tour for four weeks, back for a week, and then we're away for five weeks of Youngblood. So from the outside, it looks like these boys are just, they've got it up their sleeve. What, how are they doing this? They're just going big tour, big tour, big tour. But behind the scenes, it's like, yeah, hope, man, no, yeah. no, I, so that's why I was saying it's like, just, just believe and persevere and yeah. just hope that some comes together. And it will. So we went to the Capaldi to her. They're so, they're so active and chasing those things as well, though. And I, I think, like, like to just put it down to, to luck and all that, it, it isn't giving you guys enough credit. And, like, I think, like, a lot of younger guys that are in bands, like, need to understand that, that you do need to work your ass off to, to get these things. And, like, you're saying, like, putting your, um, what's the word, man? Like, I can't think Hatting of it. Like, like you're putting your fucking, I, can, I just can't think of the word right now. But like, actually texting Louis Capaldi, do you know what I mean? Like, ah, you're putting your, your reputation on the line. You're putting, mm-hmm. you're putting, yeah. You've just got to do it. My, Alan's really good. Alan's really forward. What like that? He'll just go and ask, and he'll just, he would, I'm kind of shy and reserved. Stand the back line. Sometimes I'll do it, but he's he's like right now. He, he wants that. He'll go and do that, but. For some reason, that young blood just fancied Alan. The two of them just were best mates, man. For the get go, he was licking Alan's face and all the rest of it, and just cool. grabbing him and jumping on him, and it was weird. It was too weird. But it was funny, but um, you, you've just got. You, I think so, eh? I think so. <laughs> but uh, you, you, you've just got. To, I said, just got to go for it. But we um, did the Capaldi thing, and that was. That was different for the young boy too, because the young boy fans are like total fanatics. The Lucy's fans are kind of like more a bit like young boy's fans would turn up at five in the morning. Lewis Capaldi's fans would turn up ten minutes before the door opened, so it was a bit different. But they, they were still brilliant. Um, it was obviously we had to tweak the set a bit, not play in your face stuff, and uh, just. But we still worked the crowd and still still did what we did. And um, it was great. I've seen the pictures that went up. It looked fucking crazy. Ah, thanks, man. It was good. And then uh, 
Lewis was Lewis was brilliant. Uh, every point they were all Scottish, so like we knew we knew Scott, the tour manager, um, because he used to do stuff for Vigos. We knew Nick did other production. He used to do stuff for Vigos. Um, we knew some uh, some of our crew and all the other boys who were Scottish. And they were brand, they were just brilliant. So they had a great laugh. The only difference was we had to we had to we couldn't go on his bus, so we had to drive everywhere. And you don't realise how big America is. So our day was like right seven o'clock in the morning, drive for eight hours, get to the venue, set up, do all the stuff, play, pack up, drive for three hours during the night, go to sleep for five hours, wake up and do the same again. So yeah. it was it was a slog. Um but it was brilliant, man. We played like we started off in Houston, then we went to San Diego, just like doing the bottom of America. And then we ended up at uh in Boston, up the top right. So we did like, cover the whole America. Um, it was just superb. And then we came back, and then we had five weeks with, with young boys playing Brixton Academy, and <laughs> just, just unbelievable. Man. Just kind of like, the year we had last year was insane. And then that that tour at the end uh, with young boys in November, just it was brilliant, man. It was so, 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 so good. Because his fans were like, it was like a headline gig. His fans are so crazy. You just turn up. And some fans would kind of know you could have scoped you out. Some fans would have no idea who you were. But for the front to the back, they were all like, right, we're in, let's go. Yeah. And they were jumping about and they were doing everything. Um, no feeling like when, when you get invited into like another band's fucking group. World. Aye. Like when the fans are like really welcoming like that, man, that's cool. It was cool. And um but see see B and with these, we used to watch other bands get all that and go, Fucking hell man, how do you get all that? What are they doing? How did they know that that person knows that person? And I guess that, that is what happens and we're just lucky that we managed to find so or get in touch with somebody like because our managers our managers a guy that works with our manager, James, who's a legend, brilliant. He was best pals with Young Bud's old manager. And when Young Bud was coming, and we've got the same booking agent in the UK as Young Bud. So there's all these connecting the dots. Yeah. Um, so it was just, I guess, all the stars aligned. And it was brilliant. But I guess it is who you know, and somebody gives you a wee, a wee puts a good word in for you. Um, because the Vigo fees, we never got that. And it was like, this is how come all these folk are getting that? But I guess that's just what happens. But it's up to you if you get that opportunity. That You get those, as you said, you get those opportunities for working hard and constantly putting yourself out there. Yeah. But it's up to you to grab that opportunity and do something with it. And we felt that we, we did some about that. And then we, we released the album. We put out our first headline tour at the start of this year and we sold it out. And that was all because building up my young blood and just building up for heaven so uh, and that was i think it was the first once you put the album out and we, once we did our first headline tour that was the first time you felt like right we're in a proper band here this is this is what it's we're supposed to do yeah um that's awesome man. which is good and then everyone's good and we're american tour and we had summer festivals and then coronavirus came up and just kicked us in the boss yeah just totally and like is there anything like in the pipeline for when this is all over? Is there like a do you have a plan? Is there anything that you've had coming up that is like being postponed? Well, we wanted to we wanted to tour the album, so we, we just did a sold out European tour. We had the American tour, it wasn't sold out, but like the, the issue with the American tour was the the booking agent booked bigger venues to get more money so we could pay for the tour. But so like we're doing like two hundred cap shows selling it to our caps in Amsterdam and Germany and all the rest of it, which is great. Yeah. We're doing that we're doing that in America, selling those tickets, but the the venues were bigger, so they weren't sold out. Still like you're selling fucking hundred or two hundred tickets in America, you're you're jumping for your first head, uh, headline tour. But uh, anyway South by Southwest booked as well. We had Transmit, we had uh, Rock Forenzy with Youngblood 
Weezer and Green Day. We had Rockham, Ring Rockham Park. We had Redden and Leeds booked. We had all these festivals, just an American tour, just the rug pulled for us. So we're hoping to, we've got to transmit for next year, and we're hoping that the festivals that we had will honour us next year. We're just waiting for confirmation. So hopefully we can just we can just uh, take that in the next year. But I guess from this, from when the lockdowns happened for the rest of the year, we'll just be writing and recording, doing album two. Because um, there's no point. Everybody's on hold. Everybody's on pause. So that's, I guess, that's the plan. Just to to, to write again. Get back out, man. Hi. I'm going from Go and do that. This, man. Like it's meant. Oh, why? Stuff that I'd done in the past was like just like small tours. But whenever we'd come off of those tours, I always felt like, really depressed because we'd go from that to like signing on. You know what I mean? So I can't imagine <laughs> from those pure massive tours to like fucking just stuck here man <laughs> it's mental it's, it is mental i feel sorry for like john our guitarist and rory and our sound engineer there like we were lucky that me and alan signed a publishing deal in november so i renewed me and alan each first pub writing deal because now i mean all we all we want to do all i've ever wanted to do is the band to be self-sufficient and try and pay my bills doing music and I've lucky to be been able to do it for the last three bit three and a bit years and Alan's been doing it for the last year and a bit. And uh, we're lucky that we signed a publishing deal that um we've got a bit of money there that we can just live on the now. But it's not not a crazy amount of money, but it's like if you live modest and just don't up the arse out it, you're all right. So we're just gonna take that into right we're just investing all any money we've got on the album too and, and try to keep it going longer. But it's it's the the our booking agent and uh not a booking sorry a front front of house engineer and john a guitarist that was their livelihoods playing live get out and doing it and when we can't do it or they can't do that they're not making any money well, we can't make any money either for you know down the line we're going to need cash um we're not going to do that but even we, we as i'm saying well i was still working part-time and we did the Imagine Dragons, we support the Imagine Dragons, and the next day you're working. <laughs> it's like, it's like, and then we're off to in the world selling arenas. But it your head psychologically, man, because like when you're in like that venue or whatever, like, and you're like, we we're talking about like with the fans, like you're, you're engaging with fans every night, and then you go from that to like your normal life, and nobody knows you, but in that environment, you're like, fucking. The guy. Pe- pe- it's weird. Well, we, I remember doing a V with his headline tour. We played like uh, we did like a, we did we did this with the ABC right. So it was thirteen hundred people. Brilliant. Should have made it the last gig of the tour. Next gig was in Nottingham, five folk. Then did London, forty folk. Rubbish. Did Bristol, five folk. Shite. Played Aberdeen, fifty folk out of two hundred venue. On a Sunday night, and that signing T-shirts and selling some merch after. Boys, that was amazing. He's uh, he's doing it for a drink. He's like, nah, I need to get on the road. Got work tomorrow. He's like, oh, are you in the studio? He's like, no, work. He's like, what do you mean work? He says, you don't work. I says, mate, I've just made a hundred quid for this gig, right? I've got to pay a tech and a front of house, a van, and a, and we've been touring, so I need to pay a tail rooms for everybody. I'm losing money for this show. Yeah. Uh, so I. Um, I'm not making any money. Even like the Youngblood tour and the Cabaldi tour, you're just throwing cash at it. You're not making any money. Um, and nobody makes money at that level until you get to like the European tour. We broke even. And the only reason why we broke even was because we sold so much merch. That was it. Yeah. And that's thousands and tens of thousands of pounds. Like right. traveling, traveling across Europe for two, two and a bit weeks ourselves. Uh, and paying crew and paying vans and accommodation or the rest of it and that's so we, the only reason why we the fees don't cover the only reason why we made money was from uh from selling merch so p- people don't realize that you lose money or you spend money people just think yeah. you're millionaires which is insane it just doesn't work like that um until you get to a level where you're like right this is um this is this is working out but meant that's what i'm saying to you how the music industry is the hardest one of the hardest 
uh, industry is about because mentally it's so tough. It's so, so tough to go through the highs and lows and the ups and downs. I mean, just the downs, man. Um, it's really, really, really hard. And you would question why MD would do it. But all I would say is we're, the biggest thing that we've ever had was good people, experienced people talking to us and telling us what to do. All we've done is, you know, listen to them and done it. It's not as if we're just all of a sudden going, we are found out something amazing and just done it and became, you know, found this magic post. It's not we just listen to people and say, just do that because we've done it and it's worked. Don't do that because it's not worked. Yeah. Um, and that's basically it. So we're lucky enough that we've, we've found those those people. Um, I guess that's why sometimes you get a wee bee in your bonnet. I see sometimes you see people putting on work workshops or talks and stuff like that and i see the people got talking about it i'm going you're not going to tell a band anything that's worthwhile sorry and i don't want to be i don't want to be like oh i know all and i'm this i'm not i'm just saying i've listened to those people before and they tell you about this that's not how it works yeah you know you, that's not how being in a band works because number one i've never been in a band so many folk that's up talking they've never been in a band before and they're telling four young guys how you do it does they work like that um you, you need to try and find people who have got experience in a track record that's doing it and listen to them because they'll, they'll tell you the truth and what's, what's best for you. Because the view with these, we spent so much money on the wrong thing, chasing the wrong thing. Um, and it wasn't until you get to a certain level that you realise that was we made so much mistakes. Even at Tea in the Park, it was just so desperate to play tea in the park so desperate to play it yeah. to play tea to play tea break play tea break rubbish just just no what no worth it just yeah. just but yeah that's all you want as a young band so i guess it's probably been a bit older and a bit more experienced but i i'd like to try and if i see young bands out young bands like the messaging just try to be honest and try to tell them what to do because you see sometimes what they're going to do, well, man, that's just crazy. He's going to spend so much time and effort, money on the wrong thing. Yeah. Um, and that's what music does to you. Just it's takes different. everyone away from you. If I were to like, tell my, my younger self that I'd be making money from like a living from music, but I wouldn't be where I wanted to be at that age, do you know what I mean? Aye, aye, aye. I don't know how I would have felt because it's like, like I'm, I'm still in it. Like I'm still involved in music. Do you know what I mean? But I'm yeah, me, but I'm not where I, I used to want to be. You know? so it's, yeah, it is weird, man. And like, I think it all you, depends, man. No idea where you're gonna fucking end up. You know what I mean, not a clue, man. <laughs> you know, fucking arenas and stuff. That's the that's the goal. Um, certainly think we can do that. Like when that's what you say. Like, having a big talk with. with Big Ross in the studio when we're, we're doing stuff. And it's kind of weird because, see, when you go to gigs and you, you don't, you're not in a band, or you went to gigs as a, young, a, a wee guy or a young guy, and, and look at an artist and you just fall in love and you go, it's magic, right? And then, see, when you go behind the stage and you see what it's like, it's not so magic. Yeah. Even you see, like, you see Young Blood, it's like he, we, we played a, he played a show, a festival in Quebec with 21 Pilots. A couple of other bands, but Twenty One Pilots are headline show, right? In Quebec, say ninety thousand folk there, right? So we are because he was put because he was playing all these festivals. Um, we were on his tour bus, so we had to we were part of his crew. We had a day off, but he was playing a festival, so we were playing. Oh, it's brilliant! We played like Jacksonville, Florida. He was playing with. Um, Bring me her eyes and all the rest of it. He's just sitting talking to him, chilling. We're just, uh, just watching it all. Uh, <laughs> we went to uh, somewhere in North Virginia, watching the Foo Fighters. Behind me, talking to Taylor Hawkins, just walking about, man. All these bands are walking about. We're going, this is just, it's just uh, insane. But one of the shows was, was um, it was an intimate fest. There was only four acts on. It was kind of like summer nights. It, Edinburgh, except on a bigger scale, it was 90,000 folk. So we're in the young bud in Quebec City, backstage, 
and this it was a, a band called the Glorious Sons of America, but they hadn't showed up, so it was just us and Twenty One Pilots. So we're sitting in this be back bit with the best catering you would ever tasted in your life. It's thirty three degrees. Me and I are on a plane. We're just having a beer, just sucking a brown Twenty One Pilots walking, just right there. Like the, the guys were just sitting going, "This is just mental, man." Uh, we actually talked to their manager and he remembered us for when he would, we were trying to start out and he was asking us how we are getting on and stuff like that. It was good. But um, what I was going to say is, Young Blood jumps on, 90,000 folk. We were sitting at night, 90,000 folk. No, it must have been about 60,000 folk were there to see him. Uh-huh. And he's playing, he's bricked down. Me and I are just sitting on the side of the stage. And if you just look at that, he's there's sixty thousand folk there, and they're, they're jumping up, going crazy, and he's just they're just playing. And then they got off, and then we just jump the tour bus, and then we, we go to the next bit, and he's experienced that. And then me and I go, we could do that. It's not it, like it doesn't. It's not as if it just goes like out of nowhere or whatever. It's it's not as if it's not within your reach. It's a step by step process. Here. It's a gradual build. Yeah. You know. If it, you know. It's not like once in a blue moon you get. Arctic Monkeys or, or Kings of Leon who just go for that to that or they just go uh, of 1975 or Capaldi but most folk tend to build and get there and we're looking at them guys though like they, they've still like earned their stripes do you know what I mean like even though they've had a form of like overnight success there was there's like all the years they went into forming that talent as well okay, yeah like the shitty bars and Oh, Hannah, but I was like Capaldi. Capaldi's played since he was twelve in all the all the pubs everywhere. I mean, I mean, we, we did a before he released Bruises. Party of Fever, man. Uh, before we did Bruises, we were in uh, Berkeley in town writing a song with him. And as that was happening, he's like, man, I've just been staying in my manager's one bedroom flat. I've been sleeping on the floor for a year. And he's been sending me to sessions and just writing songs and no money, I've no nothing. Just want to, just want a record deal, just want to do this. But I can't be, you know, I think these songs are amazing, but I just don't know what's going to happen. I said, like, I'm hear these songs. He showed me his songs, showed me bruises, and I said, man, this stuff's brilliant. He said, I'll see what happens. And then he released bruises and he got to number one on Spotify on, on Music Friday and I phoned him and I was like, man, your, your life's about to change. He's like, shut up, I'm telling you. Your life is about to change, and then just crazy. Yeah. But even like Jerry Cinnamon, Jerry Cinnamon selling at Hamden, unbelievable, and then selling all the selling it everywhere. Yeah. And then people going, "Have you had a guy called Jerry Cinnamon?" I used to play with Jerry Cinnamon when he was in the Cinnamons, the deal with these years ago. And you go back, you, you go back to Jerry Cinnamon. He's playing every shitty bar under the sun, but he just grafted and grafted and grafted. These guys have all, as you've said, in their, in their stripes and been out and done it. Uh, and you just don't know about it. Like, so even like when I was, like my manager talks about um, Rag and Bone Man, he'd been, he'd been signed for years. He'd been out for years and he was flopping. And some German commercial picked up Human as a sink. Fucking boy up. Yeah. Jesse J. Jesse J was on a label for seven years before she made she made a she got a, a hit song and started taking off. So people don't realise, people just think you come out of nowhere and you're you're this, but no people do put in the graph and the effort and, and the work to to try and get there. But again that it comes down, man, it's 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 belief and perseverance. Um because you literally it's last year's a prime example of or well, St. Phoenix prime example of no idea what's happening. No idea what's around the corner. Literally, just hoping and staying in the game that something will happen. That's it. So the fact that you are MDs still making music, you know, you, you've got a chance as much as anybody else if you keep going. It's crazy, man. It's like this that fucking just listening to you talking, man. I think it's been like one of the most insightful like podcasts so far, man. <laughs> it's just what. It see, the thing is. I can go back to this, but this this thing about talking to like just like people who want to listen, and all I'm doing is telling stories of. Or if a band ever asked me what to do, all I do is carbon copy 
explain what Tim Vigon for the Zootons in the streets or what Matt Reynolds has talk, said to me. The biggest thing they talk about is being distinctive and different. And I, it, I never even thought about it before. I was like, why? My fu- so, so, for instance, right, this is, I didn't tell you this, but we did a showcase in London just before the Eagle Thieves split up and we played King and we played the one St. Phoenix songs as Vigo Thieves right before. And the label said, you guys are, uh, the drummer and the singer, uh, are the only guys at Class Mark, the rest of the band are too old. And that's what they said to us, right? Because especially in the UK, there's an ageist thing, man, if you're over 22, then, do you know what I mean? It's daft. Uh, it's all right now, America, they don't give a fuck, but over here, it's a bit crazy, but it's not, it's not as bad as it used to be, but, um, you're wig on or something. Aye, aye. Or you die your hair. You, you put just for men in like me. But um basically uh what happens is uh I was thinking about that and then I, I, I spoke to the Imagine Dragons guy and said, Listen, put it this way, you could go to any city in the world, any major city, and you could pick out a four or five piece indie band. I said, ah, you could. I could name Get into Glasgow and every band's a four or five piece indie band. He said, how many bands could you pick in the world, right? Or, or, or playing that kind of music, how many bands can you pick out in the world as a two-piece and the brothers doing that kind of music? And I went, there's only one band in the world doing that kind of music. So I just, he said, there you go. Yeah. You have to be different. You have to, don't copy anything. Don't don't try, just be inspired by people and take bits from everywhere, but don't try and rip MD off and don't try and just be be distinctive and be yourself. And that was another one thing was our managers came from a background in London. It was all about be this and be that. And I was like, this is just shit. I'm not trying to be this or that. I'm just, see my band, it's me and Alan, my brothers. We like having a laugh and a good time. And our objective is to make our fans or anyone that listens to our music or see us or come in contact with us. We just want to make them feel good. Yeah, We're not professing to be artists or stars that we just want you feel good by making you laugh and making you feel good in the music that's that's our thing and we spoke to you know, I speak to we played Dallas we we, we young bud and he's he's tired man because he's he's just gives a million percent I, I wouldn't I wouldn't trade my place with him at all because he has worked to the bone with his management his label he's constantly doing stuff yeah. bump 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 he's a machine don't be wrong, he's only 22, so he's, he's younger. Um, he's got that energy, but he's he's just non-stop. But I was in the bus, and he came right after the show, he came flying on the bus. It was only me and him in the bus. And I mean, I was in, unbelievable. He said, I'm so tired, Steve, I'm so tired. He said, give me, he said, and I was just talking, he said, ah, give, give me one second, grab his phone, Instagram uh, story. And he just flipped through being so tired into this ball of energy, going, I love you, damn, I should have been. And I'm going, put his phone up, I said, what were you saying? And I was like, what happened is that I've got that's what I've got to do, man. I've got to turn it on oh. and then give them it. And then and I sat down and I talked to him. I was like, so our managers are like, you need to, you know, get young buds doing it. And I was like, and I was like I'm not young bud. I don't want to be young bud. That young bud, young bud. And he's like, you just got to find out what people like about you, whatever that is. He said, it took me three years to realize what people or my fans liked about me, about being the, you know, the outcast being the the emo weird kid i can be that guy that stands up for all the emo weird kids so it took me three years to understand if you'd really work out who that was yeah and then i just amplified it and i just spewed it out and people just grabbed it mm-hmm. they said you've got to find out what the thing is that people like about you and just go so then we found out that that's when me and Alan started just to really be ourselves and just it was the brother thing. Just amplify the brother thing, amplify the Scottishness, amplify that kind of thing. Do good music. Like do, do just make the best tune you can make. Keep that separate, but your personality let that shine through. And that's when it really started to take off. Yeah. Even we speak to to Lewis. He's a man we talk about we're talking about social media and stuff like that. that basically what happened when my manager just told me be like a solo 1975 and being conspicuous in that. And he's that like, Ryan, I'm a chubby guy for Bathgate. What are you talking about? Well, I said to my accent, look at me. I said, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. So I just started I said, I just started going, I don't give a fuck. 
and soon as they get fucked, everybody just jumped on it. Yeah. Everybody just loved it. I and it is, it's a bit being yourself. How, how like Lewis could sell out fucking like the hydro doing stand up. Like he's just he's so it is, man. himself in a fucking amazing position. Do you know what I mean? Like nobody could fucking cancel him. Do you know what I mean? Because he's just he's on he's on himself, man. And that's a big thing. Even you know, when we went to Philadelphia, we played Philadelphia. It was last night too, and he's uh, we're going to go for the karaoke bar. Uh, after the show, we go for a drink. Is that right? ideal? So I get an Uber. So jump an Uber with me. No, it was, it was his. It was his. Uh, I jump an Uber with me. But he picks him up because for my my photographer lives here. And he picks him up for their house. And then he takes some back to the tour bus and go to the bar, jumping to me. So I jump in the back, driving towards a uh, photographer's house or whatever. He jumps in, he's like, Who the car help with this? And he gives me, he says, he says, Put this in the back seat, put tappy, but grab this big rectangle thing, this big frame thing. I was like, What's that? He's like, it's my, it's my plaque. I says, What? He says, It's my plaque for my, my double platinum, my American single. I said, that's the closest you'll get to one of them, son. I said, you're fucking drunk. You're fucking drunk. <laughs> but, uh, brilliant, man. Just, just yeah. hilarious. And uh, that's what it's all about. It's about, I, I, I don't think we've ever met, like, Imagine Dragons guys were just so brand new. Everybody we've really uh, met, we're lucky enough that we've never met any complete and utter cocks. Everybody's been sound. Yeah. Which is which is lucky. Like the Arizona boys, even like with, with, some, with a small run with Eliza and the Bear, just brilliant guys. Um, Arizona, Capaldi, Youngwood, just just really really top top dudes. So we've been been really lucky with that. Um, and that's 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 another thing, man. Um, they always say that be. I love. I we consciously try to be good to the, the support acts, or if we MDR supports us treat them the way that we get treated because it goes a long 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 way yeah totally. um because these guys who are supporting you could probably be bigger than you one day and if you went what you know you never know what happened but apart from that just 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 be nice people i think that's 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 the thing because there's too many horrible people there's no point being like that um so that's that man that's that's the the the, the journey what i laugh <laughs> hilarious that's, it's been know. fun you, I think you keep up with like a lot of the American podcasts, don't you? Like, aye, aye, yeah. I like a lot of podcasts. And you, you I've seen uh, all, like you should get all your fans to fucking harass like, like fucking Brendan Schwab and like. Theo I love, uh, that, I love, uh, I love Schwab and I love, uh, I love Callan and I love Theo. Von, I love Chris D'Elia, but he's in fucking he's some shit creek now, man. Yeah, he's. Man. I was saying that to Big Ross. Like I loved, grew up like idolizing, loved Ryan Adams, and then all that shit happened to him about the Me Too movement and him being a fucking sleazy prick. And I just all my teenage years and that I was listening to Ryan Adams just doing the drain. And then I literally listened to. I'm not a massive fan of Chris D'Elia's stand up, yeah. but I'm a massive fan of his his podcast. I'm a massive fan when he's. He's on the fight and the kid, or he's he's doing stuff with yeah. Brian Callan. Just love the slagging with each other, yeah. and then oh, that stuff came out, and I was like, "Oh man!" Did you see his rebuttal though? Like he's, I saw his rebuttal, and I saw he's so basically Daily Mail put an article up the day. I actually yeah. talked to to Capaldi about this because Capaldi's a massive fan of Delia, yeah. and um, he put something up about uh, he put something up about um, once he asked their age. And found out they were on. He, he just said, "Oh, sorry, but he, see, be fair. That's no excuse, man. That's yeah. It's there's no excuse for being an absolute creep, sleaze bag. So see, you don't know. Like for instance, the the t- Twitter is insane. Twitter is the most toxic place in the world because we get bat we get battered a couple of weeks ago, um, for uh, the Black Lives Matter thing." And obviously, the UK is completely different for America. Different, yeah. like it's happening, and that's just happening in America. Like nobody really in the UK, bands wise, were tweeting anything about it. And 
because we've obviously went and toured with Dom. Dom's in LA and he's down at the front lines and we we stuff and we didn't even knew eyes. Yeah, like he's on social media all the time. I'm not on social media all the time, but he was he put stuff up. And we were getting tweets going, "Why are you not putting anything up? What's going on?" And I was like, "I no idea what's going on. What is the problem?" And is that like, why you're not saying this? Why you're not using your platform? And I was like, "I said, look at you. I didn't think that anybody really cared, but I was saying, and I don't really want to speak on behalf of that because I feel like I'm a white guy and I want to listen to people and I want to be educated on it. I don't want to be. I don't. I, I, said, I don't really know. Can." can I just want to sit back and digest it and find out the right things to say and learn about the right things before I even open my mouth or say anything. It was just like, you just aren't doing anything, not using your platform properly and you are being too, you know, and I was like, what is going on? And just all oh, these tweets, then we put something up. So like, it's not good enough, you're saving face. But to be fair, then you go back and everybody got that kind of treatment about either not putting up the right thing or not putting up enough. And, and it's like, well, it's not really, you know, a hundred percent Black Lives Matter and a hundred percent all this stuff, you know, going on is horrible. And I'll do, you know, I've did more, I've did more for that the Black Lives Matter movement with my life rather than have on Twitter yeah. speaking to people, educating, educating myself, educating my family, my neighbours, my friends, people in the, the uh, people of colour in the music industry that I know. Yeah. Um, FaceTiming them, speaking to them, listening, saying, "What? What? Tell me what? You know what? What is up? Um, tell me what's really educate myself on what to do. Signing petition, donating. But because you've not put something up, you look like some instance you're dickhead. But that's not the case. Yeah. So it's a it's a scary place, man. And you see that on a you see that on a daily daily basis. So you just got. I mean, and that's one of the things as well. But I said to you, when you see Youngblood and he's like, he treats it like he's an artist and he's a, you know, he's a, an influencer. And, that. and me and Alan don't see yourself for that. Me and Alan see yourself like just two dudes, just playing that, two brothers playing the band. Yeah. Not like, we literally don't take ourselves too seriously. So I don't want to be like this guy, you know, you know, down the front of a rally and saying, this is what's happening. Because I'm, we're just not like that as people. We, 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 we be active for that cause in a different way rather than being you know all on social media so it's a scary place it's sometimes man. Of, like i've been able to educate people without having the power of just being able to rip everything away from somebody do you know what I mean? like like the thing that is so malicious about twitter is that someone can just can position you how they want in their argument and if that and, catches wind man you're gone do you know what i mean and, and yeah like, it's scary still here like um I think you're totally right. Like the just the the fact that he was messaging is sort of creepy and weird in in and of itself. But yeah, there's a, there's a massive difference between that and and being a pedophile. A hundred percent. Like I think there, there needs to be some sort of like policing. Do you know what I mean? Of of Twitter in some way or some way of managing the. I don't, I don't even know how you would do it, man. Do you know what I mean? But no, but yeah, right. There's too many blood lines. It should be right. Okay. The guy's not a pedophile. Yes, he's a he's a weird creep that's used these power and used whatever it is to 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 you know be sleazy and whatever against girls bang out your order and you shouldn't be doing that and I should be called out for that. But he's not a pedophile. And and there there's two different levels of things. So I think that's that's usually right. If you, if someone says something and if you don't you know uh, rebuttal or come back or you don't say things the right way you're, you're obviously vilified and it's it's wrong i mean i've seen the thing with barack obama uh put up at the end of last year saying all these people on twitter you know cancel culture and saying you know thinking they're activists and spewing down people's throats that you're doing the, the polar opposite of what you should be doing you know if you're looking to get someone educated you would be doing it in a way that people go right all right right okay how can i do to help you know yeah, I'm, in, I'm into that. Not, listen, if you need help, I'm here to help. Tell me what to do rather than saying, you should do this, you should do that, and you're this, and you're that, because you don't do that. It's like, yeah. you're not going to get through it MD. But listen, you can understand why people are angry. You can understand why people are charged and energetic because of uh, because people have been cooped up in their house for the last three months, and they're, they're like that, and you can understand all that, but a lot of the anger is misplaced, and a lot of the anger is um, yeah, it's, it's put the wrong people. Um, 
and I guess that well, I said it to Alan, it's just part and parcel of being sort of upper level in the music game and being in a band that maybe people ha- has a has a decent fan base. Obviously, that's just part and parcel of it. You just got to be TB wise to that and use your voice in the right way, which we have never really uh, properly done because we just didn't think the indie cared what we thought. You know what I mean? It's just a way it goes because I don't like I don't like seeing bands being political. Don't be wrong, the, the Black Lives Matter thing, I think we did probably get it wrong in terms of not putting up. I think we we, we managed it wrong by being uh, not pressured, well pressured in a way, put something up that wasn't maybe sincere when we did it. And then we took two days off to, like, a weekend off to properly like, dive into everything and understand it. Yeah. And then put something up that, was just, uh, that we, we, we thought about and we wrote time and time again and we meant. So, um, but I don't like, that's not really a political thing, that's a human rights thing and it's important. But other things, you know, things happening in Yemen or things happening in Saudi Arabia, things happening in China, all these things, there's, there's things, lots of things you could do and say, and you don't want to be that band that's, I mean, even you see a Jerry Cinnamon talk about, I don't want to talk about football, I don't want to talk about politics, I'm here to talk about music, and that's it. That's all I'm here to talk about. And that's kind of about our, we don't get on we post Rangers stuff up because that's we can't help it. But it's not to be proud of because Rangers are shite. But uh, we put that stuff up. But apart from that, if you just I don't want to hear people's views on something else. I just I, if I like someone for music, I just want to hear their music. Yeah. Uh, unless they come out like, for instance, Morrissey, and be a total right wing idiot and just make a complete arse he's still doing that they well, I'm not going to listen to him anymore um, that is such a that's like a British like way of being isn't it like everyone used to get like annoyed at Bono and all the fucking people that were trying I, to drive it down your throat man but like in America like it's, it's weird because because of the internet like the sort of like American attitude towards those things are starting to like bleed into you've got to be this this social justice warrior type dude and it's like ah, it's different i mean don't be wrong it's uh, my favorite band the all time is rage against the machine i remember when i first listened to him i just changed into this total rebellious wee guy who yeah. was total left wing and i loved it mm-hmm. and then uh, and it's all good all well and good but you grow up and then you, you're listening to other artists who are just like right dead center and you think oh that kind of makes makes sense to me and they're not singing about all this stuff that's happening or poetry. they're just singing songs yeah. and getting a bit songwriting and that's that that's what and i realized that that was i will just do that i'll just i'll just that kind of thing and listen if you want to go and use your platform to go and do all that then 100 percent do that man yeah. and that's your thing go go ahead that's just not what my band is all about because I don't see myself as this, you know, cutting edge influencing artist. Um, the cool thing about music in general is, though, is like regardless of whether what political stance you take, like you can bring those people into the same room and they can all e- like enjoy something equally. Do you know what I mean? Like, and there's no political separation. You know what I mean? Like, you can. I think that's the good songs, man. But that even like regardless, of, like Serena Williams, a tennis player, all people, she put something up. I hate all this black versus white, this you know Republican versus Democrat, this versus that. It's like see if you want to vote for Trump, vote for Trump. See if you if you want to do this and that, it's fine, all good. There's there's no problem with that. And I'm giving you respect, and can we still be pals? Can we still talk? You don't have to because you're that you think different for me then you have to you hate hate someone and vilify someone because they've got a different point of view i think that's where you know that's where a lot of the noise comes from it's just like i've always been center left in anything i've ever done i've never like obviously younger people listen to rage against machine you you get but then you mature out a wee bit and then i'm always probably liberal center um but I would never force my opinions in someone's throat. And I'd never shout at someone and say, you need to just do that. Um, it's just unhealthy. And if people have a different opinion, then great. That's that's part of the that's part of what makes the world interesting. So if you're 
you're going to be talking, if you're going to be forcing, it's a form of fascism if you're forcing your views down someone's throat, basically what it is, basically the, the, the very the, the very nature of what you're standing by is, is you're doing the opposite from. Yeah. Um, the world's a, a crazy, a crazy, crazy place. Um, so, and especially when you go to America, I'm like, America's nuts. <laughs> America's amazing, but insane. The food in America is whew, just unbelievable. The food that we ate was insane. Some of the places we've been to uh, driving through, you're like, holy shit, man, this place is messed up. Texas, driving from Austin, which is one of the most liberal cities in the world, going to Dallas or Houston, or like Dallas is like you driving through all that. Uh-huh. Trumpville, man, Trumpville. <laughs> um, it's like flags, flags the size of football pitches, American um, flags. I was really confused, man. Like, I, like, you see so much on the news here about like Donald Trump, right? And I went and played in a, a coffee shop in Orange County. Right? Just mm-hmm. like, through someone in the family managed to get this gig. And I just made a passing joke about Donald Trump doing it. And it like went total flat. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, like, I'm, in a, I'm in fucking Orange County. We're probably <laughs> the people here have voted for Trump. The majority. Trump. The, you, 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 need, you need to know your audience. <laughs> but that, no, that's a, it is. Like, and it's quite funny. We're like, the young boy shows like all the, but all the weak kids there are, you know, they all hate Trump. But all their parents up the back probably voted for him. So you just, you just, that's just the nature of the beast, man. It's, it's America's a strange, strange place. Don't get me wrong. It's like how Donald Trump even get in that. I think that how Donald Trump get in that position of president, it's pretty much is mind boggling. But it sums up America. It, it's. You know, if people go, how did he manage to to end up president? Well, it's America. Like that's the reason why it's not surprising. It's it's obvious why why he's done that. Um, and we we get that. Like when we go to um, when we went places, what do you guys think about America? Honestly, so I think you're I think you're mental that you allow guns. Because that's the be all. That's the the main problem with everything. Even if like even the thing with, with with George Floyd, it's the fact that you empower people with that that having a gun at your side empowers that guy. Yeah. He's he's I'm telling you, he's not going like, like that guy's not going to. There's not going to be any police brutality or things like that happening if they don't have guns because they know that's their last resort. They can use that. That's a sense of power. You take that away from them, they will they'll they'll. Um, I think the the levels of brutality will will, will drop because guns empower evil man and i think you need to take that away from from your cops and also like i've, I've heard some pretty like good arguments from americans of why they should have guns right and i i leave like the the video or whatever i've watched the debate and i, I think mm. well, i can understand why people would want guns and then i look at where i live and guns are banned and i've never <laughs> had to do with a fucking gun you know like i'm yeah. not to, no. just it's crazy man it's, but that's it. The, the, the argument will give is the Second Amendment about the fact that you can bear arms against the government to stop mm-hmm. a, a tyrannical government. Uh, but there's no tyrannical governments, and they keep running about this. You know, the greatest country and the freest. Like, listen, you get that in Scandinavia, you get that in Europe, you get that all over the world. Get Australia, mm-hmm. get in Japan. They're all democratic capitalist, or you know, they're. they're Democratic countries with the capitalist based economy, so you, you can you can go that way. You're not the only country. Um, you know the way to limit gun crime is take guns off the street because that's you know that's why Germany, France, UK, uh, Australia have don't have mass shootings. I mean, don't you, you still get shootings, but you don't get you know year on year on year or cops killing you know cops killing people. You don't get that to any like terms of um percentage of population that you do in do in America. So um and also the healthcare system is stinks the fact that you have to pay for it. That's why my my message works for the NHS and that's the one thing that we should try and protect is the NHS because it's such an amazing thing. And you've got 
Americans having to pay for the healthcare stinks so bad. Because like, again, like I, I understand why they're afraid of it because like the the argument is that like oh well, then then your government could just fucking let you die. Like do you know what I mean? Like a government fucking Aye. healthcare system might not give a shit about whether you live or not, but the, the doctor that you're paying has to. And I get that chain of thought, but it's so weird how how different it actually is when you've got a fucking public yeah we take take money out and it's you take money out it's human beings so yeah. it was a, a, as a human being and you know a doctor is compassionate for you know if a doctor's compassionate and professional he's want to save someone's life or help someone then money doesn't come into it money shouldn't come into it and i think that's the the case uh in the uk and people we, we, we um who have free health care i think it should be a, a fundamental thing on anything so yeah. The fact that you have to pay, like the guy we stayed in San Francisco when we were over, he was a wealthy guy, but he was almost bankrupt because of a sore back and the, his hospital bills he ended up paying like seventy five grand on a for a sore back. Mm -hmm. And is that like, the only reason why I paid to get it done? Is because I had the money to do it. And I don't have any family. I don't have a. I said, "Well, I'm going to spend my money. I'm not going to leave it to him. I don't have any kids. I don't have any family. I'll just spend it and get my." But it got so much, I was almost had to remortgage my house because. I spent money in, in healthcare, and I was like, it just doesn't make any sense. It's a reason why, you know, it's a great country, but it's messed up, man. It is so many homeless people. San Francisco was frightening how many homeless people, um, LA, frightening. Um, like, you, you go in Glasgow, you see homeless people. You see homeless people all over the world, but the amount of people you see are homeless in these places. It's frightening. That's just in a country, as they say, look at the, the military bill of America. Uh, they could sort out a lot of problems if they, if they, I think, oh, well, what's the military bill compared to China and, and uh, Russia? I think it dwarfs it like 20 times over how much they spend. Yeah. It's just mental, man. No. It's, don't be, don't be wrong, but it's a, you, get this thing for america like been we were there so much last year just dying to get back because it is it is amazing it is, it is brilliant so i oh, will just wait and see the world's just getting nuts and nuts and we'll just see what it takes this man it's crazy um i'm gonna wrap up just now man just because we're getting to the two hour mark yeah two hours man we all good man I all good, man. It's all over. We should we should do this in person as well, man. Just I hundred percent. Cool. Hundred percent. Just having yeah, a on as well. Having a I don't want him on. He just he just dumbs down the the conversation. <laughs> he just talks about food and farting, man. He's rubbish. Cool, man. Uh, <laughs> no, I no get get Alan on. Um, be good. But um, what what are you doing with yourself? Another? Are you are you just um? doing the solo stuff and working on i know you're doing the, some of the we're doing weddings as well before yeah, obviously this um, shit happened my, my main like source of income sort of from weddings and a, a band that i was in previously like like touring and stuff like that sort mm -hmm. of, um turned into my solo project just sort of similar to yourself man like what I, I was realizing it wasn't going anywhere we there was a point in in the band where it was like uh, we were getting to a level and then something happened to our management and, and record label and mm -hmm. we, we ended up which <coughs> and, all that, and it, it just was starting to get really stagnant man so uh, that was around the time where I started working with Johnny and listening to him as well he was yeah. he was kind of making it clear that like having less like what I got from his, his experience with Texas was that like Texas looked like a band to everybody, but behind yeah. it's, it's it's Charlene and Johnny. So like from from my crashing thing, I was like, well, I want to be able to go out and play as a band, but like when the band's not there, when I'm not playing live, it's just me sitting writing and doing what I want with it because yeah, I, I hated the I didn't hate it, but it, it was sort of like impractical. Where if I wanted to like get a support slot. I had to go around five different people to see who was available. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. We crashed in. Like, I can go, well, I'm going to play that gig and I can source the guys to play it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. No, that I get, that, that makes complete sense. Um, yeah. And and that's that's the right thing to do. 
Um, so that more power to you, man, with, with that kind of stuff is just, plus if you're the driving force for it, you're the guy, people don't get it. You know, people don't realise like the amount of work and effort you have to put in just to be that guy, yeah. driving it forward. That's why a lot of people do it. That's, I remember that saying is like, the most successful people in the world that do the things that 99% of people, other people don't want to do. Totally. And that's always stuck with me. It's like so many. The, the, the final thought for this thing was when we spoke to a, a record label dude, he said, we look for three things in this order. Number one is your work ethic. Number two is your likability. Number three is talented. If you don't have the three of them, then we don't bother with you because you have to have the three. If yeah. you can be you can you can be likable and you can be talented, but you don't work hard, you're going to get nowhere. You can be talented and work hard, but see if you're a prick, nobody wants to work with you. So you can be likable and work hard, but you can be shy. It's not gonna get anywhere. <clears throat> so it's about having those three things. That's the the most important thing. Yeah. Uh, and that always always stuck with me to, to do that. So that's what we try and abide by. Be good guys, work very hard and just you said just keep writing and doing stuff and find out what people like and when you find that out then just keep doing it man yeah well you guys are fucking smashing it man like no thanks man next year trying Very trying our best <laughs> well we'll wait and see man who knows what's going to happen but yeah. uh this i used to worry a lot not worry but I used to be like mm, i used to drive you on and used to be scared uh about because you've got you know things like mortgages and houses and you know livelihoods you've got to provide and you think you've got all that thing flying in your mind but the last year's told me is that nah you'll be fine just you know you just got if you keep doing what you're doing whatever that is you'll be fine just keep working hard so um i that's that's i guess next year is going to be fun but whatever happens absolutely man um, yeah, thanks very much for doing this, man. No bother, man. Yeah, we'll... Give us a shout anytime, and once this crazy period is over, we can go and grab a beer or a coffee or something and awesome. do it in person. Yeah, absolutely. No bother. Good. Glad, glad, uh, glad we, managed, we managed to make this in the end. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird, isn't it, man? Like... Oh, I mean, I know, listen, I know what you're all about. I know how, how it goes with that yeah. kind of thing, just trying to find time and try to get a bit of peace and quiet. So it's all good, man. Don't worry about it. Class mate. Right, I'll catch up with you soon, brother. Right man, see you later on.